Welcome back to ECE 320A. We have two more homework assignments. We don't have that much time left. I need to double check when the final exam is in this class, but I hope you already know what day that is. Is it a Tuesday? So pay attention to your other exams because sometimes they may not be on the same day as your class meets. Now that they've changed the structure of the finals, you could have a Tuesday, Thursday exam or class schedule and your final could be on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. So it's maybe a good thing that our final is on a Tuesday because you're at least familiar with doing 320A on a Tuesday. Heaven forbid you might have to try to do it on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. That might really throw us off, right? If we have. And you'll get four sheets for the final exam if 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 needed <clears throat> and maybe you'll need some of those sheets for Bodhi plots and that's what I want to talk about today and I want to really give you insight into the ability to quickly sketch the magnitude and phase behavior so that if you now start plotting these in MATLAB or some other software package you can basically check what the program is giving you, its output response, and you can say, uh, that's not what I thought it should be. Or if you know how to sketch Bode plots, you can potentially use that to your advantage if you want to try to design something. You can actually do the process in reverse. You can sketch the plot, and now you can say, oh, I know that correspond that break corresponds to a zero. That break corresponds to a pole this corresponds to a pole and I know where those frequencies are and now I can design my transfer function. Once I've found my transfer function, I can then figure out how I will realize that in a circuit. And that's sort of the reverse process and used in using the Bode plots to your advantage for a design purpose. And that's why I want you to have insight into H of J omega. H of J omega is complex. Because it is complex, it has two pieces, a magnitude piece and an angle piece. And we will actually plot the magnitude in dB, which allows us then to add up all the different component pieces or terms in the expression, algebraically. We can add those up, even though they're multiplied and divided in our transfer function, because we're taking the logarithm, we now and looking at it in dB terms, now we can simply add up these individual contributions from each of the different terms in our magnitude plot as a function of frequency. We also can add angles or add and subtract angles as we have already learned. And we'll simply sketch these angle pictures for the individual terms and then we can simply add up those pieces or components together to obtain the total phase response. Just like we will find the total magnitude response by adding up all the individual pieces once we've sketched those. I want you though to keep in mind that this particular discussion that we are having or the techniques that I'm showing are for minimum phase systems. At this point in the semester, do you remember what minimum phase is or what it corresponds to? When I say, oh, you have a minimum phase system, what can you immediately see in your mind? The poles and zeros are all in the left half plane. If you sketched all the finite poles and zeros, all of those X's and O's will be in the open left half plane. So let me say all poles and zeros. And here I'm just... What do I mean by the open? 
By open, I'm meaning though that does not include the imaginary axis. That would be the closed left half plane if I included the imaginary axis. You don't want poles and zeros on the imaginary axis. Well, if you want to build an oscillator, yes, you can have poles on the imaginary axis, but most of our poles are not going to be on the imaginary axis, so I'll just say open left half plane. Let me now talk about this. I'm going to try to talk about it generically by means of a specific example, if that makes any sense, but I think it will help your understanding versus me trying to talk about variables and equations and being general and generic, maybe it won't make as much sense as if I pick some numbers and go with that. Let's now say that somebody hands you the following transfer function, h of s, it has a 4,000 and it has a factor of s plus 0 0.1 in the numerator. Downstairs it has an s, it has an s plus 200 and it has an s plus 6 squared plus 8 squared. And I hope by this point in the semester, you are already picturing in your mind x's and o's in the left half plane. Well, in the s plane, and in particular these are all in the left half plane. Because in this factored form, our coefficients, we factored it into quadratics or less, and if you've done that, then all you have to do is look for present and positive, right, in order for those to be stable or in the left half plane. And we have factored this into quadratics or less, and if you've done that, then all you really have to do is check those coefficients that are multiplying the s term and the constant or the s to the zero term and those need to be present and positive and then you're good to go. You don't even have to plug it into your calculator to determine where those are located. But this way, the way it's factored, you should be able to see where those are located and in, and in particular this, is, this representation of the transfer function is what I will call the pole zero form. It's explicitly written in a way that it's factored to see or show the zeros and the poles explicitly. And that's what I will call the pole zero form. And that form, if you're given that, you can now immediately see what you have. You have how many finite zeros? You can tell by the way I guess I, here let me confuse you, zeros, you just have the one and it's at minus 0 0.1 radian per second. That's pretty close to the imaginary axis, but that's a zero. That doesn't influence stability. <clears throat> Where are our poles? So maybe I shouldn't have done that. Here, let me go back and do the following. Let me just say the left half plane, <laughs> because I want us to be able to sketch poles and zeros at the origin, and those are obviously on the imaginary axis. Okay. So when we're doing these sketches, we want our poles and zeros to be in the left half plane. I'll just say left half plane, and then it's implying actually the closed left half plane. Let's now look at where our poles are. And now the plural form of pole makes sense. And if we sort of progress from left, well, I've done this example actually several different, or created it on the fly. So let's say we have one pole at the origin. That's s equals zero. We're looking at all of the values, finite values of s that cause that denominator to vanish. We have another pole, it's real, at minus 200. And our last poles 
are complex and they're at minus 6 plus and minus j8. And I will try to keep this fact that that particular factor is at the origin. That has a special case when we're developing terms or looking at sketching these in the Bode plot sense. So I'm going to sort of make that very clear that something at the origin, whether it's a zero or a pole, you do have to treat differently than the way we're treating the others terms. What you, and let me just say that this particular factor, because we're going to be writing it many different ways. We've just written it s plus 6 squared plus 8 squared. That's how it came to us, and that we could immediately put into minus 6 plus and minus j8, but that also, if we multiply it all out, will be 36 plus 64 is 100. And another way that you might see this written is actually written in terms of general variables. You might see it as s squared plus 2 zeta omega sub n s plus omega sub n squared. That will mean a little bit more to us when we get further along, but I want you to be comfortable with that particular parameterization of a quadratic factor. Meaning, from this representation, I hope you can immediately see that the natural frequency of that complex pole pair is 10 radians per second, and that actually tells us the distance or the length from the origin to that pole. That's just the hypotenuse of our two poles that are complex. The other thing that we can then factor out is if we say, oh, 12 is actually equal to 2 zeta omega sub n. In this case, it's 12 is equal to 20 zeta. We can then find zeta. In this case, zeta is 0.6. We are going to go to the extreme in this class because I just really want you to get the idea or the concepts. When we have complex factors, we are going to just make our life easier by simply saying, okay, he's got a complex factor. Let me just sketch this very crudely. I'm going to just say zeta is equal to 1 and sketch it for that case. And that will then boil this complex set of poles down to two real poles, and we know how to sketch two real poles. But let me get to that in a minute. But for now, just think of that complex pole being written in many, many different ways. But what we want to do, actually, before we get into sketching the Bode plot, which we've already learned a lot about that transfer function just from this pole zero form, to sketch the Bode plot, we actually need to convert it to a different form. And the form we need to convert it to is called the time constant form, which in the Nielsen book maybe calls it standard form. I'm not sure, so check my terminology. To, to get it into time constant form, what we want to do is we want to now normalize each of these factors such that this, these constant terms are equal to 1. So we're factoring those numbers out of each individual expression. And let me show you then what that looks like. What we want to do now is think about putting that transfer function into pole zero form, I'm sorry, into time constant form from pole zero form. So we want to convert h of s to what we will refer to as time constant form or that says that we are really trying to normalize all of these constant coefficients in these factors to 1. 
doing that for this example that I have cooked up, we have h of s, we have that original scaling piece, 4,000. Then we factor out the zero location, which was at 0 0.1, and now I have an s over 0 0.1 plus 1. And I'm writing it in this form so that you still keep track of where the pole or the zero was located. You can still explicitly see, oh, the zero is at 0 0.1. If somebody asks you for the time constant, what would you say for that particular factor? What's the time constant? The time constant actually is the variable or number that scales s. So if we look at what's scaling s, it's 1 over 0.1, or it's 10. So that has a time, fact, or a time constant of 10, that particular factor. Let's now keep going. We don't have to do anything with the pole with the origin unless there was a constant already in the denominator, and that we would just factor out or keep factored out. Then we have the... Whoops pole at 200, and then we have this quadratic piece, which I am going to factor out in a special way. Now I have s over 10 squared plus, and now I'm factoring out 10 from this in two places. Meaning what I have done in that particular second case for the quadratic factor, I started with something that looked like s squared plus 2 zeta omega sub n s plus omega sub n squared. I factored out the square of omega sub n, and I actually over here I split it into two pieces. That's what I was doing. So that now everywhere I have an s, I really have an s over 10. And this now allows me to write that as omega sub n squared, s over omega sub n squared plus 2 zeta, s over omega sub n plus 1. That's what I did in that last piece. And now I can see that 2 zeta was actually just 12 over 10 or zeta is 12 over 20 like we had before. Questions on that? Let's now look at the different pieces, and the different pieces that I'm interested in, I've tried to include in this example. I have my constant term, which I need to put together. I have linear terms in both the numerator and the denominator. I have this special term that is the origin piece. And I have another term which I will call the quadratic piece. So this is my linear factor, as is this one, and my gains are highlighted in blue. Is that clear? I've identified then a gain piece, an origin piece, a linear piece, and a quadratic piece. And if you can sketch those four pieces, you know how to sketch Bode plots. And we're actually going to overly simplify the quadratic piece so that it boils down into a squared linear term, and that'll make our job easier. I just want you to get comfortable with how you sketch this, and you'll know then how it varies or changes as that zeta fluctuates in the real sense between 1 
and zero. Let's now look at these different terms. The first term, well, or let me say different types of factors. Did you guys sketch Bode plots in 220? Okay, that was the right answer. I just was checking to see if you were still awake. So I didn't expect you to have sketched or worried about Bode plots in 220. Let's look at the easy piece first, which is the constant term, or I may say the constant factor. That was this 4,000 number, which was then multiplied by 0 0.1 in the numerator. We had a 200 and a 100 downstairs, and if you do all of the algebra, the 4 and the 2 sort of combine a little bit, and we're left with 200 upstairs, and we're left with 10 to the 4th downstairs. Or we now have 2 times 10 to the minus 2. Or if that scientific notation is troublesome, we have 0 0.02. But the scientific notation is maybe helpful in thinking about what we have relative to the magnitude in dB terms. In dB terms, we simply take 20 log of that factor, which is the 0 0.2, if you had your calculator. If you are somewhere and you don't have your calculator, well, you can also do the logarithms because you now know that 0 0.02 is 2 times 10 to the minus 2, and you know how to treat the product of, the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So we now have 20 times log of 2 plus log of 10 to the minus 2. And this, that was easy, right? The exponent just pops out front of the log and we have minus 2 times log of 10, which is 1. So we have minus 2 for that expression. Or you could say the log of 0 0.01 is minus 2. What's the log of 2? And this is base 10 logarithms. We said that was 0.3, didn't we, last time? So now we have 0.3 there, and this now becomes minus 1.7. Or we now have 20 times minus 1.7, or 2 17s, become 34. So we have this constant corresponds to a gain of minus 34 dB. And you could check that. If you had simply 0.1, that would be a gain of minus 20. Just 0.01 would be a gain of minus 40. So we're between 0.1 and 0.01, so this makes sense. Is that clear? We now can sketch that. We now know that it's that gain piece associated with this particular expression. Here is our 0 dB line. If somebody said, well, here's my graph paper, and this is minus 20, and this is minus 40, you now know that you are living a little bit closer to four, minus 40 than minus 20, and you are at minus 34 dB for all frequencies, and we'll have to figure out what frequencies are important but we could put some on here. We could say, well, we have 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the 0, 10, 100, etc. And this is the logarithmic scale, and that's typically just labeled as our frequency omega axis in radians per second. And if somebody asks you what is the phase of that constant, how would you sketch that phase? That one's zero because it's a positive number. If it was a negative number, 
if we're negative, instead of positive, we, I'll just say let's just treat that as minus 180 degrees. If it was minus 40 or minus 60 as a constant or minus 10, I'm just going to say the angle is minus 180 and you take the 20 log of the magnitude of that number to obtain its magnitude value. Let's now look at the linear pieces. There shouldn't have been any questions on, I hope, the gain pieces and this will be somewhat of a review. I think we've already covered this but let's say in 2a let's talk about the zero factor. The zero factor was this s over 0 0.1 plus 1 and the reason why we want it to be in time constant form is so that we can add or introduce new factors without having to go back and adjust the gain. We've now factored all of those gain pieces out and once we've done that now the gain simply goes up and down if we change the gain but if we change any of these factors it's not going to change the gain as long as we keep it in this time constant form. And that might be important when we are doing some kind of controller design. We want to look at the frequency response. We are now looking at walking up the imaginary axis, meaning we're replacing S with J omega. And now we want to sketch this complex number as a function of omega. That's all we're doing in the Bode plot. But the complex number has two pieces, a magnitude piece and a phase piece. Let's plot the magnitude as a function of frequency. Let's plot the angle as a function of frequency. If we sketch the magnitude of this piece, then that's 20 times the log, again this is base 10, of j omega 0 0.1 plus 1. And do you already see what that looks like? What did we talk about last time? We sort of looked at three different numbers or three different frequencies. We looked a decade before the break. A decade before the break frequency in this case corresponds to what value of omega? Of omega. zero point one times this break which is zero point one so you have zero point one squared or point zero one so this is ten to the minus two is a decade before this particular factors break frequency Is that clear at that point omega is much smaller than zero point one and so that imaginary part basically is gone and we just have log of one which is zero so this magnitude plot is going to be flat until we get to the break frequency omega equal to 0 0.1 and then once we get to the break frequency we have to remember whether we are sketching a zero factor or a pole factor and that tells us how we move after the break whether we go up or down if it's a zero it's in the numerator we're going up and how fast do we go up for one linear factor 20 dB per decade and that's a factor of this 20 that's out in front to give us our 20. So the way that I sort of tell myself as I say oh this magnitude is flat until we hit the break frequency and the break frequency is 1 I'm sorry 0 0.1 radians per second so our magnitude plot will be flat until then at that point it breaks so it breaks at omega equal to 0 0.1 and it goes with a slope after that of plus 20 dB per decade. And remember what a decade represents? 
this is just something to know or write on your crib sheet. What's a decade represent? Or what kind of a factor? What multiplying factor? Ten. That's a decade. Ten years is a decade. That's how you can remember that. And for those that are musically inclined, what's an octave? If you're, pardon? Eight notes? <laughs> Eight whole notes? That's not quite how we want to think of so those notes are represented in terms of frequency we want to know the frequency change in an octave it's a factor of two okay so an octave represents a factor of two meaning if you're not going very far in omega maybe you don't want to go all the way to a factor of ten a decade later maybe you just want to go a factor of two later on the frequency axis to see where you should be at with your slope, you can say, oh, I'm going to go an octave over. So if I was at omega equal to four, I say, oh, an octave later will be at eight, and I should be six dB above where I was at four, at omega equal four. Is that making sense? Or if you went from four to a decade, you'd be looking at 40, and you'd be 20 higher if it was a zero factor. So depending on whether it's a zero factor or a pole factor, that slope will be plus or minus 20 dB per decade or plus or minus 6 dB per octave. And you can, those are equivalent. All right. Now that we have that word description, we can now sketch the piece associated with that zero factor. And we know Or you might write that as 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, or 10 squared. Now, what does that particular zero factor look like as a magnitude sketch? So now I'm sketching the magnitude of this zero factor. And it was a linear zero factor. We said it's flat to begin with, and it starts at 0 dB. And it was flat until we hit the break. The break was at 0 0.1, and at that point, we start sloping. And now I could say, oh, this represents 20 dB, and this now represents 40 dB, meaning I should be able to now just sketch this. And once the pole or zero turn on or break, you never have to worry about them turning off those factors. You can just keep drawing that line. The phase is another story. Okay, But this is the magnitude piece. What does the phase piece look like? Are there questions about how to sketch a linear magnitude? A linear factor's magnitude. We look for the break frequency and we're basically done. We just have to know if... I guess we were done. There was the music. Okay. Oh, you wanted an encore. Okay, so here we go. We want the phase. The phase, what I like to do is actually just concentrate or look at three critical frequencies, and I'm guessing you won't be able to guess what those are. Ha ha. So look at three critical frequencies, and once we found the value of the phase at those, or the approximate value of the phase at those three, three frequencies, we're going to then just connect those points with a straight line. And the three frequencies that we will be interested in are the three that we've already looked at before. So we'll look at, let's say, omega-1, which is a decade before the break. Maybe I should have done that a different way. Let me 
we have the actual break frequency and we have the other frequency which is a decade beyond the break. And we are looking at, in this case, we are always looking at the angle of J omega over 0 0.1 plus 1 for this omega sub n, or I'm sorry, this omega sub 0 of 0 0.1. If we plug in omega 1 to that formula, what's the angle associated with this frequency? It's pretty small, isn't it? It's 1 plus j.1, and we're just going to approximate that as 0. It's about 6 degrees, but we're going to just say it's 0 at that point. What is the angle here? Let's call it theta sub 0. When omega naught, we have j omega naught over omega naught for the imaginary piece, that's j1. So now we're looking at the angle of 1 plus j. I'm waiting, 45. And that's actually the actual value. That's not an approximation. Then at omega sub 2, we are now looking at J10 plus 1. And that's, it's not really 90, but that's what we're going to, say it's equal to. It's a little bit less than 90, but we're going to just approximate it as 90 degrees in our straight line sketch. And I put positive numbers on those because this was a zero factor. We now have our omega axis And now what do we constant? Where was our omega naught? Right in this factor, that was our omega naught, was 10 to the minus 1. And, and notice what you have to realize now with the phase angle. You have to worry about it beginning to contribute an angle a decade before the break actually happens. That making sense? So now we have to have something magic happening. Actually, the straight line approximation will kick in or begin a decade before the break. Because at the break, it's contributing 45 or minus 45 if it's a zero or a pole. Meaning we now have to start back here at 0 0.1 omega naught and go until we go a decade beyond, and then we stop the sloping. That's what I meant when I said the phase, you can't just set it and forget it. Now we're on an infomercial and I'm selling some kind of Bode plot machine and on the magnitude you can set it and forget it. You don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? Isn't there a rotisserie oven commercial or something where he says set it and forget it? Used to, I don't know, I don't watch too many infomercials, I hope. <clears throat> but now, in the phase, you can't do that. You have to turn it on a decade before the break, and you have to turn off the slope, meaning it's going to remain flat beyond that particular location or that frequency. Meaning the phase now, because it's a zero, it's going to go up, it's going to eventually reach plus 90 degrees. It's going to go through 45 degrees, meaning it's now sloping at 45 degrees per decade, and it does that change in phase over two decade span, and then it stops sloping. When you're sketching phases, so this is the phase of our zero factor. Questions on that? Once you, and you have to turn these on a decade before the break. So the phase curves are a little more challenging to sketch. Yes? 
here's maybe the rough approximation. Remember what we were talking about before? If we had a pole right there, then let's say this was at a distance omega naught into the left half plane. It's at minus omega naught. Then here, let's say, is j omega naught. And here is 0.1 j omega naught. And oh boy, way up here is 10 j omega naught. Do you see that? I hate to cloud up. Oh, you know what? I don't have to. This is the, the beauty of having such... <laughs> Try that at home. Sorry. So if you've already sketched your notes that tight, you probably don't want to be cutting and pasting another piece. But now I'm saying this is 10J omega naught. And this is probably not very accurate. But here is the angle of the first piece. Here's the angle of the second, and that one should be 45. And then what we're doing is saying, and obviously that's not 10 j omega naught, so 10 j omega naught's quite a bit further. I didn't want to make you feel too bad, so I just stretched my page about an inch instead of much larger. Okay. But do you see why you can only go to 90 degrees? You can't get any more than 90 degrees from any linear factor, and they're all in the left half plane. That's right. So the non-minimum phase, so if you're thinking about that, if I put a pole over here at the same location, but now it's plus omega naught, what's the length of that hypotenuse to each of those three points? It's exactly the same as what it is for the left half pole left half plane pole, right? That hypotenuse is... The, but what about the phase? If you look at the phase due to this minimum phase pole, it's 6 degrees. What's this phase? 174, 173 degrees. It's not minimum, is it? Well, that's a non-minimum phase. Is that making sense? So if you really had poles and zeros in the right half plane and somebody said, oh, sketch your Bode plot, I would just draw my poles and zeros in the S plane and calculate these out versus what we're doing here. We're developing our tools so that everything is living in the left half plane. Our angles make sense over there. Questions on linear factors? That means we can quickly think about the pole. I hope. This is now, <laughs> thinking Shakespeare now. <laughs> We're at 2B, okay? Uh, 2B or not 2B? Sorry. All right. I have to wake you up somehow. You guys were a little bit... All right, so what do we have? What was our pole? We had a pole of S over 200 plus 1. That was in the S domain. We are replacing S with J omega to sketch this. And now, can you quickly sketch the magnitude plot? All you, what takes the time is drawing the log paper. And where do I need to be? Or what's this magnitude plot look like? This is now the magnitude of our pole factor. N D B. What's critical here? Or how do I put down a critical location on this axis? What's the critical point in this particular case? 
and it's called many different things. I've called it a break frequency, I've called it a corner frequency, I've called it a pole, I've called it a zero. But now I hope you understand why I'm calling it a break. Because that's where the break occurs in the magnitude clock. In this case, we're interested in 200. And where does 200 live? Well, it's a little bigger. So now we're doing Goldilocks. <laughs> a little bigger than 100 and not quite 1,000, right? So it's just right. It's 200. And what's the log of 2? 0.3. So we're 30% of the way from a hunt, where were we? 100 to 1,000 on our log paper. And you may not have semi-log paper. You may have rectangular. So now you say, oh, there's 30%. So there's 200. And now I'm going to be 0 dB. I'm going to be flat until I hit that point. And then I will go up. And I could go over here to 2,000 and go up to 20 dB. Whoops and say, there's my point that I need to intersect. And I could then tell myself that that's plus 20 dB per decade. If I said, OK, in this straight line approximation, what's the magnitude of that factor at 400? What are we doing per octave? How much are we going up? What's our slope? 6 dB. 400 is one octave higher than 200. So we should be in this straight line approximation at 6 dB. We started at 0. In fact, if you did the Bode plot and you just had this particular curve, where would you physically be, or I'm sorry, more accurately be positioned in your magnitude at 200? Where would your actual curve be if you sketch this in MATLAB? 3 dB. Where? Up or down? If it's a pole, it's down. Why did it? You guys wake me up. What are you doing? Gosh. Can you guys please? I had to stay up grading, <laughs> so I'm not quite all here, obviously. Yes? So this was a pole, wasn't it? Where are the poles? They're in the basement. I should have been going down. Boy, that you were too polite. Well, for a pole, it's minus 3 dB. Okay, so we have minus 20 dB there. Now are you feeling better? And if you actually wanted to know what MATLAB was doing, it might look more like this as the true curve. And it would be at 3 dB down below if there were no other poles and zeros. Because if there are poles and zeros, they will contribute a little bit of their information to this plot. And so if your poles and zeros are not very far s separated, they are all going to start bleeding together. But we're not going to worry too much about that. Yes? So where do we get the slope of 20? I maybe didn't make that point very clear today. I don't know that I made it that clear the previous lecture. But if you look at that piece, you're taking 20 log of basically j omega. And now you have this 20 log of omega. Our log of omega is really the independent variable that we're sketching with respect to. And that 20 is the amount that it's sloping. When we get beyond, when we have, let's say, the J omega piece dominated. So when omega was high relative to our break frequency, then we have 20 log of basically omega. And log of omega is what we plot with respect to, and the 20 is where we get our slope. Does that help? So that's where that 20 comes for a linear factor. Yes? <laughs> 
So now I, I'm quickly sort of showing where that 20 comes from, but I'm sort of doing this hand wavy description. But it basically, if you now say that if you just looked at, for example, that written in a pole zero form, then it would maybe make more sense in terms of that point. 0.1 is factored out already. And now you just have 20 log of whatever you have. Now, what do we want to do? Oh, that was just the magnitude piece. What's the phase piece look like? And I'm going to try to And I probably, if I was doing this again, I would relabel my axis. So I've now shifted this. I'm sorry. This is not how I would really like for you to do it. I needed a lot of cycles. But I want to at least show you where it starts and stops. Where does the phase begin showing itself in this particular picture for this pole? So now really virtually slide this axis to be consistent with what we have just sketched. Here's the point 200. We now need to be worried about a decade below and a decade above that break frequency. And that's where we turn things on and turn things off. And because it's a pole factor, we are going down we will eventually get to minus 90 degrees. We're going to start at zero. And that's now our straight line approximation to the phase curve. Questions on that? So now we've done gains and linear factors. Let's look at factors at the origin. In this case, we just have the 1, and it was actually downstairs, so everything will go down for this case. We have a pole, and it's just giving, given to us as the S, and we're replacing S with J omega, which now, if we want the magnitude of that, we have 20 times the log of that which and I've sort of really this J omega is downstairs so you could think of that have being raised to the minus one and now we have a minus 20 out front of everything but I'm being a little sloppy here I'm just worrying about the slope part but what is different now versus the previous linear factors How would you explain this? There is no constant term, is there? So we're missing this additional piece that would have normally been here. So we're saying we're missing a constant piece. And because of that, actually, we're always on, aren't we? This is 20 log of omega always. So this is always sloping. Or another way of thinking of it is this one never breaks. So if you were really looking at the practice exam and looking at break frequencies, and I didn't include that factor at the origin, now this is explaining why that's true. That polar zero, if it's at the origin, never breaks. It's always on. Pardon? And it's angle, you're getting way ahead of me. It's angle is a constant, isn't it? Because you're just looking at the angle of J omega. You're looking at the angle of an imaginary number, a pure imaginary number. Now, the only problem with this is I always compare this to your birthday parties. Okay, let's go a little bit earlier in your youth and say when you were at a party, did you ever play pin the tail on the donkey? 
So here we have a sloping line, and in this case it's a pole, so it's going down 20 dB per decade. But what we don't know is where do we, where do we put that on our Bode plot? We know it has a slope. We now need to figure out where do we pin it. Where do we pin the tail? Where do we pin this magnitude plot on the... We're just musically inclined because we're talking a lot about frequencies today, so I think the frequencies are just audible today. <laughs> what? Wow. Sorry. Like I said, I am going on little sleep. You don't want to see me. Oh, never mind. So now, where do we locate this sloping line? How about we go down the street to a convenience store? We'll pick a convenient location, right? So we pick a convenient point, and what do you think omega might be for a convenient point? What would be an easy thing to think about in terms of a value? If we picked omega equal to 1, log of 1 is 0, and that'll be a pretty easy location to find. So when omega is 1 on our horizontal axis, our height is 0. Is that making sense? So our convenient point is omega equal to 1. That now gives us 20 times the log of 1, which is 0 dB. And that now says, therefore, this pole that's located right at the origin it has a slope always of minus 20 dB per decade and we say that it passes through zero dB at omega equal to 1 radian per second. And now we're ready to make that sketch. We have 10 to the 0, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2. This now says that we pin that sloping line right there at 0 dB. We're not breaking, so we go and we're sloping with a negative slope, so at these other points, we actually have to be coming down from them. So at low frequencies, we have a high gain. And in terms of an operator, if we had a transfer function that was 1 over s, now we have a, a system that's 1 over s, a filter that's 1 over s. What does that represent if you had to think about it in a processing sense? What is that system doing to a waveform or a signal that comes into it? If you have a transfer function in the frequency domain that's 1 over s, what does that correspond to in an operational sense in the time domain? So now these transforms could represent either signals or systems. 1 over s as a signal looks like a constant, doesn't it? But we don't want the signal version, we want the system version. So now to think of the system version of 1 over s, maybe it's easier to think of the opposite. What does multiplying by s in the frequency domain do as an operation in the time domain? If I said s, x of s, what would you do in the time domain? You would say that's x dot, isn't it? It's the derivative of x. So now 1 over s, x of s, is an integral. So this is what a pure integral would be looking like in its frequency response with no gain or a gain of 1. 
this is now an integral operation. And that has its advantages in terms of behavior. What's the angle? We're now looking at the angle, and I'll make sure that we know that it's now a pole. This is now, if you said, oh, you have a pole at the origin. In the S-plane plot, and now as you're walking up this curve, you're looking down there. You're looking down there. You're looking down there. What's that angle? You're having to turn and go minus 90 degrees every time. It doesn't matter the frequency. It's always minus 90 degrees. And that's for all frequencies omega. No matter where you are underneath that circus tent, when you're looking at the angle from your present location back to that pole, you're at minus 90 degrees. So this pole at the origin always contributes minus 90 degrees. That's a single pole. Those are easy to sketch. You don't have to worry about when they turn on or when they turn off. You simply need to go to your plot and sketch a straight line at minus 90 degrees. And that's true for all of these frequencies. Questions on that? Yes? Okay, so that's why now you're putting all of these pieces together. Now I'm hoping that you're starting to make the connection because the question was answered when he was asking it because he started to visualize what was going on. You now have this pole in the complex plane, and if you forget what's the angle of that pole, you can just sketch the S-plane, put the pole down, and say, if I'm walking on the imaginary axis, where do I need to look? And I'm facing the positive right real direction. I now have to turn 90 degrees to see that pole. And I go a little bit further and I turn. I'm always turning 90 degrees to see that pole. All right. Now let's look at the other remaining piece. And now it gets exciting. Here's our complex factor. In order not to get too confused, well, I'm actually going to confuse you probably. But here is our, let's say this is minus 6 and this is J8. And this is minus J8. What I want you to start to understand is this distance is our natural frequency omega sub n. This distance is actually another frequency. Called, so this is our, well, how am I going to label this? So let me say this is our natural frequency omega sub n associated with that complex pole pair. This is another frequency, and we will call it our damped frequency. That's actually the argument. If we said, oh, this is a signal with poles at minus 6 plus and minus j8, you would say, oh, that's a damped sinusoid or cosine. And the damped frequency is 8. So this is e to the minus 6t cosine of 8t. 8 is that damped frequency. You don't really see the natural frequency in that. And so now, if, so here is one more term. Well, how am I doing this? So I'll try to remember. This is what we call our damping. That's sigma, typically. So here is our damping of 6. 
But what I want you to get comfortable thinking about is if I put this pole, if I had a string and I now went to the, your high school geometry class and I sketched the arc, if I put a pin on a string and I simply sketched the arc with the string being held tight at the origin, I would now have this quarter of a circle. Does everybody see that? And where would that circle be? It's going to come up here to J10 and it's going to go down there to minus 10. This point right here is when we have no damping. Zeta is actually our damping ratio. That's the term that is used for that. This is the damping ratio. Whoops, not ration, but ratio. And this is when zeta is equal to 1, and this is also our damping ratio. But what we are going to do is we are going to simplify our life. Well, by simply saying anytime you have complex pole pairs in this class, just because that's our agreement so that you don't have to worry about sketching these to real fine detail, I'm just going to allow us to rotate that, those complex poles so that they have a damping of one and we'll just treat them as two real poles at minus omega sub n. And this sort of connects when somebody earlier said, I don't quite understand why e to the minus 6t, that 6 is a frequency. Now, if you think of that minus 6 could have been associated with complex poles, and now it's a real pole. Anyway, this you'll get more comfortable with this as we go, but let's... I've thrown quite a few definitions in there, but what we want to do is look at the extremes. <laughs> I didn't know you were so interested in these extremes. So what we want to do is very... So what we are doing is we are keeping omega sub n constant and varying zeta. So let's say extreme number one. Here we have zeta equal 1. So in that case, what we have, in our particular example, what did we have? We had an s over 10 squared plus 2 times 0 0.6 s over 10 plus 1. That was our a actual fact, complex quadratic factor or term with a zeta of 0.6. What we are going to do is we are simply going to approximate that with zeta equal 1, and here is our zeta. So we're actually changing 0 0.6 to 1. And if we do that, we now have s over 10 squared plus 2, s over 10 plus 1. And that should look familiar. Isn't that the same as that? So we're boiling, we're swinging those complex poles to the real axis, and we're just going to say, for what we want to sketch in this class, let's just worry about replacing or approximating these complex factors with two real poles at a damping equal to the natural frequency. And in this case, our natural frequency was 10. And you should be able to sketch that. Now we have, here is our omega naught. 
We're flat until here, and then what happens? Well, if, if we didn't have that exponent 2, once we hit 10 omega naught, we would be at 20. But since we're doubling that, we are now down to minus 40. So now we're changing at minus 40 dB per decade. And we're not turning off. And what's the angle look like? So that's the magnitude. We now have 0 0.1 omega naught, we have omega naught, and we have 10 omega naught. We're starting at 0 still, but now what are we doing? We've actually combined two linear pieces, and each linear piece contributes 90 degrees. And it's a pole in the negative direction, so we're now going to go all the way down to minus 180 degrees and right at the break frequency we're at minus 90 degrees and we're going to connect those with this straight line. And that's now the plot that we will use to approximate our complex pole factor. That's extreme one. Extreme two is the case of zero damping. And I'm just going to quickly sketch that. If this is omega naught, what happens if we don't have any damping? Well, we're zero dB, and then when we start to get close to omega naught, we just take off, and then we come back down. And so at these limits, this is going to be minus 40 dB per decade. That's going to go off to never, never land, and that's not zero degrees, but it's zero dB. Similarly, in the angle picture, now everything happens right at omega naught. And if you don't believe me, just draw your S plane again. And what happens as you're walking up and down that imaginary axis? If you are located right here, what's the angle? Well, you look down to get the one, and then you look up to get the other, and they cancel each other out. Right? The angle contribution by those two. But what happens when you magically step beyond that top pole? Now you have two poles contributing 90 degrees, and that gives you your instant change from 0 degrees to minus 180. And we'll pick up at that 